Behind me is uh, the city of Munster. It's in Westphalia uh, in uh, what is uh, present day Germany. But in 1648, uh, Westphalia was, uh, uh, was a duchy. It was under uh, the control of, uh, of a prince or a duke. And uh, the scene of uh, three treaties that were negotiated and signed in two cities, uh, two of the treaties uh, signed right here in, in Munster. Collectively, uh, these three treaties are known as the Peace of Westphalia. They created the international order that uh, is still in effect today. And uh, today we're gonna talk about them. Okay, let me share the screen with you and we'll get uh, it started. Okay, there we go. Here are the terms. You should already have seen them uh, on the PDF. After this uh, presentation, by the end of it, you should know why the various belligerents, all the people, all the countries involved in uh, um, in the Thirty Years' War, chose to negotiate a peace settlement. The major results of the three treaties of Westphalia, the main principles set forth in the treaties of Westphalia or emerged from it over time, the concept of realism, the elements of grand strategy, the basic outline of the limited wars that occurred between 1688 uh, to 1789, the concept of limited war uh, and French aid to the United States as an illustration of the Westphalian system. And I want to introduce this presentation with an examination of this painting. It's a very well-known painting by the Dutch uh, artist Gerhard Tourbolk, uh, depicting the ratification of the Treaty of Munster uh, in May 1648, and this was the uh, uh, the treaty that uh, created peace between Spain uh, and the uh, the Dutch Republic. Um, and since Terbort was a, uh, a Dutchman himself, this was uh, obviously a very uh, important uh, event for him. Indeed, the, the Peace of Westphalia was a common subject of numerous paintings in the mid to late 17th century, which gives you an idea of its great importance to the people of Europe. Most of these paintings were allegorical in nature, but this painting, the most famous of all depictions of the Peace of Westphalia, was notable for its realistic portrayal of the moment of ratification in May 1648, the moment that it's been signed by dignitaries from Spain and the self-proclaimed Dutch Republic. And this is the moment when that uh, the signature, which had been done in January 1648 is ratified now in May. So this treaty confirmed Dutch independence from Spanish rule and so marked the formal founding, uh, <coughs> excuse me, of a new uh, nation. The Catholic uh, King Philip II uh, had gained control over much of the, the Low Countries in 1558, to give you some background. 10 years later, the northern most parts of the Low Countries, mainly Protestant Calvinists, John, the ideas of John Calvin, the two main Protestant thinkers at this time are Martin Luther and John Calvin. We, you've seen Martin Luther, we haven't gotten a John Calvin, maybe we will at some point. But parts of that area uh, had begun to re revolt with the aim of winning religious and national freedom. And this grew into a bitter war of independence that raged for um, a total of 80 years from the, the start of hostilities until the end of them with the Treaty of, uh, of West um, of Munster. And incidentally, um, most art historians think that Turborch was present for the ratification. He was right there because 20 individual, uh, 20 specific individuals have been identified uh, in the painting. 
And uh, one of those individuals is Terborch himself. Uh, if you look all the way over to the left-hand side um, in the front row, you will see him. There he is looking at, uh, at you. Um, and uh, and supposedly, you know, being there in person to uh, uh, to watch this, um, you know, what to watch what happens. So now, what's interesting about the painting is that it's realistic rather than allegorical, solemn rather than celebratory, reflecting the fact that the Treaties of Westphalia, the Peace of Westphalia, was a piece of exhaustion. It had no clear winner. The belligerents simply wanted to end the Thirty Years' War. And indeed, proposals for a negotiated settlement had been floated for a number of years before um, the, uh, uh, the parties came together in Westphalia uh, to negotiate peace. And the realism of the painting um, unconsciously reflects the international order that emerged from the Peace of Westphalia, uh, also known as the Westphalian Settlement. Um, and the Westphalian Settlement is the term used in this presentation because it is suggestive of this new international order. And this in, in international order is familiar to us because we still live within a Westphalian system Although some scholars of international re relations have argued that we are moving into a post-Westphalian uh, world. And right now you're gonna be you know, wondering what I'm talking about, but I'm gonna get, uh, get to it right now. Okay. For centuries, Europe had been ruled by extended families of noblemen, informally known as houses. Now, this map depicts the dominions of the House of ha Habsburg in 1556. Um, and it shows the lands that, uh, that this family controlled. Uh, House of Ham House the House of Habsburg had gradually become the foremost house in Europe. And until 1556, all Habsburg lands had been ruled by a single emperor, uh, Charles V, who in addition to these dominions also presided over the Holy Roman Empire, hence the title of emperor. And those lands aren't shown um, in, uh, in the, the, the first map, so I've overlaid them uh, here. And now you're looking at um, uh, a map that's more or less corresponds to Europe around 1600 on the relative eve of the Thirty Years War. So now this, what's in purple, is overlaid uh, on a map of modern Europe, you know, Germany, the Czech Republic, and, and so on, which gives the impression that the, um, the Holy Roman Empire was, um, was somewhat unified. It really wasn't. It was, it was um, composed of about 300 uh, principalities, small, day, small states, duchies, uh, and so on mostly German speaking and ruled by princes who nominally owed allegiance to the emperor of the Holy Roman Empire, but often tried to gain as much autonomy as possible. Martin Luther, who you've already heard about, escaped execution largely because he received protection from one of these princes who saw advantage in facilitating a religious split uh, with Catholicism since it would reduce the power of the, Cap the Catholic Habsburg emperor. And it's been said that the Holy Roman Empire was neither holy nor Roman nor an empire. And there's considerable uh, truth in that. It's, it's the, the, the term should suggest it's fragmented uh, nature. Now, since 1589, France had been ruled by the House of Bourbon, which and, and the House of Bourbon continued to rule France until 1792, when revolutionaries proclaimed a French Republic and soon executed the Bourbon King Louis the, uh, the Louis the Sixteenth. 
and pretty soon afterwards, uh, his, um, his wife. So. Okay. Now take a look at France in this, um, in this, uh, in this map. Notice that France is essentially surrounded by the Habsburg uh, lands. Okay? And even more so if you include the principalities of the Holy Roman uh, Empire. This was of great concern uh, to, um, uh, to France. And it forms the reason why in the early 1630s, uh, France began to finance uh, Sweden uh, in its war against the Catholics um, in Central Europe. And then in 1635, entered the conflict uh, itself and remained there until um, to the end of it. I wanna talk first about the, the major uh, territorial changes as a result of these treaties of Westphalia. First, to repeat, the Dutch Republic gains independence uh, from Spain, ending the 80 years war. Switzerland, also achieve recognized status as an independent sovereign state. The Habsburg entities in Central Europe conclude peace with France and Sweden. War between Bourbon France and Habsburg Spain will continue until 16, 1659. The Holy Roman Empire fragments into 300 separate sovereignties. Now I'll explain what sovereignty means. Um, in the next segment of this recording. France gains Alsace, a German speaking region on its borders, as well as smaller territories. Overall, these accessions increase the power of France. The state of Brandenburg, Prussia uh, in, the, in Central Europe, the Eastern part, um, receives territories that expanded it and eventually led to the emergence of Prussia as a great power. And the overall result was to strengthen France, facilitate the rise of Prussia, and reduce the power of the House of Habsburg, especially in Spain. Okay, see you in the next segment.